Welcome to Sound and Fury. I am Eric Wilfred Watson. And I'm Hugh Frank. And I'm tired of these mother snakes on this mother plane. Today we're going to talk about airplanes. So, I am a novice when it comes to airplanes. I remember when I was a kid, my grandpa used to show me books about you know, World War II airplanes, and I mm. thought it was cool. I went to air shows when I was a kid. I liked airplanes. And then I completely forgot about airplanes. And, and then you saw the movie Airplane? Yes, and I learned everything I need to know about airplanes from the movie Airplane. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Yes. And I've flown on airplanes before. And I know that sometimes there are airplanes in movies. Yes. And according to you, sometimes those details are a little bit not quite correct. Yes. So this is our show about how they mess up airplanes in movies. Um, so yeah, so number one on our list of... <laughs> oh, go on. Oh, you were finished. Oh, well, then allow me to retort. Um... So probably one of the number one uh, F-ups of airplanes, the way they uh, depict airplanes in movies is, so <laughs> when you have the airplane noises wrong, I think a lot of people won't detect it, but anybody that knows anything about, uh, about uh, airplanes at all will know that a piston engine uh, or a uh, turboprop sounds a lot different than a turbine engine or a jet. <laughs> So one is a kind of noise, the other one's a because you've literally got a piston stopping and going at thousands of RPM uh, versus a circular thing spinning, right? To put it in the most layman's terms. Um, so there are countless <laughs> movies where somebody's up in in a uh, in a in a jet or in a you know turbofan engine and it's, or a turbofan plane and it's and it's and the sound effects people use generic airplane noise and give it no right. thought whatsoever right and a, and a really good uh, movie to watch that gets all of them wrong is the movie Airplane. But you think they do it wrong on purpose. They do it wrong on purpose. Um, one way of saying is that if you want to get every question wrong on a true and false test, you have to know what the answers are to answer false, right? Because otherwise you're, you're apt to get 50% just by dumb luck. So Airplane literally gets everything wrong in the movie and that's what makes it great. Um, so that's a good that's a good frame of reference, uh, but yeah, as they're flying along in this in this you know jet engine, I think it was a seven twenty seven, I believe. Um, you hear in the background the whole time because it's clearly wrong. World War Two fighter plane, sort of. Yeah, basically, they're like an old bomber or something. Yeah, like a like a four like the uh, B uh, B seventeen uh, was would had uh, four. I think they were radial, but you know piston engines, and so that thing had a had a bit of really loud kind of hum to it i think that was the noise they were using for a for a three engine 727 you know with uh three jet engines so yep so that's number one i never noticed that never noticed that oh, nope. okay um here's one that the next time you watch any kind of movie with an airplane keep an eye out for this because people use stock footage a lot and you'll have different airplanes taking off or landing and you don't have to be an expert on, you know, okay, this is this type of airplane or this is type of that. Just count the engines. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. Literally, you'll have like a 747, which is a four-engine jet uh, taking off. And then in mid-flight, they might have uh, a, a twin. So just one engine hanging off each wing. They might have their uh, three engines, like a 727 has an engine kind of below the tail. Um, <laughs> and so they'll, in, while they're in flight, it'll be like maybe a twin or a triple, and then they land again on its four engines because, again, they're using just stock footage and <laughs> they don't pay attention to which planes are taking off, which planes are flying, and which planes are landing. Um, so it's, it's actually really funny. Uh, and then the interior doesn't really tend to match a lot either. 
Um, and like for example, the the 747, uh, DC-10, some of the bigger jets have a lot of room inside, so they'll have like seven or eight seats all like mm-hmm. kind of lined up in the middle. Uh, but but they'll take off in a much smaller airplane, and you know when they go to the interior shot, they've got all kinds of room, and they're just lounging about. Uh, that just doesn't happen when you only have like one or two rows for people to sit in. There's an atrocious airplane drama that they released on some streaming thing during the pandemic that nobody watched. It had like Kelsey Grammer in it. They had a casino in the air type of thing. The outside of the airplane, even I noticed. The outside of the airplane was some big jumbo jet huge thing, but inside was just like way smaller than it should have been, and the cockpit looked like it was something from some 1970s. It looked, yes. it looked like it was from the movie Airplane, actually, but it was, you, know, you could tell that it wasn't even close to, and even I picked up on that. I don't remember the name of the movie, but I'll figure it out and throw it on the screen here. Okay. Okay. Kelsey Grammer, huh? Unfortunately. You a gambling man, Jack? Not anymore. Once a gambling man, always a gambling man. Hmm. Is he related to Kelsey Spellcheck? Ah, uh, he was in Star Trek. Yes, he was also an X Men. Hmm. Anyway, but that's a beast of a different color. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, he's feeling blue. <laughs> that indeed, that indeed, that indeed. Um, Ali versus Frazier. Anyway, so not sure really how that fits in anywhere, uh, other than he was Frazier. Did you catch that? Brett Spiner was on a Frazier on a Cheers episode. Was he? Yeah. Sweet. Maybe Cheers is a holodeck episode. Ooh, maybe. Maybe. We're talking about airplanes. Yes. I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. Um, another... <laughs> <laughs> Another one that they tend to you'll tend to notice from time to time is people confuse the airport with the terminal. Do you know the difference? No, but George Carlin made a good point that nothing associated with air travel should ever be referred to as terminal. <laughs> That's a very good point. Terminal velocity, terminal illness, terminal. Oh, it's landing. An airport <laughs> is the whole freaking thing. The terminal is like American Airlines will have their terminal. Right. Delta will have their terminal. They're yep. like different segments. Yep. Okay, we gotta pick a road, arrivals or departures. We're arriving, but then we're departing. Which one, Snake? Yep. It's it's I mean the reason it's called a terminal is literally it's the end of the it's at the end of the line. It's where the airplane stops and the passengers disembark or embark to, to begin the new, you know, trip or whatever. But yeah, the airport could be several miles of uh, you know, runways and uh, in the case of like the Denver airport and many others, there's also um, several hundred miles of underground stuff happening with the, all the, they have all kinds of different conveyors and inventive ways to lose your luggage. So I remember flying to Iceland. I first flew to Minneapolis and then caught a flight. And of course the domestic, you know, small flights are on one side of the airport in this terminal and the international flights way the fuck on the other side of the airport and yes. they have 45 minutes to get there and it's whew, and that's why you have to, that's why you have to reach <laughs> terminal velocity uh, yeah yeah otherwise you end up with a terminal illness anyway uh so yeah so that's one of them um so an, another one too that uh really gets uh <laughs> and is a little bit a little bit harder but so many folks believe that all communication happens with the tower. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Um, the tower is just one... Well, it's a tower. Um, where one group of people are that, that handle communications for just one portion of the flight. But most of the time, and that's within about a five-mile radius. Kind of like the talking on the radio halfway across the country to Chicago on the radio. Yes, and that doesn't really happen. There's there are many many steps. There's your there's your departure. There's your approach. There's uh, various communications relays along the way. Um, so yeah, the tower is just a, a small portion of the communication for just a very specific part. Uh, and that again, that's just within a five mile radius. So, yeah, like, and again, airplane got it completely. They're like in, they're flying over like Kansas and they're talking to like Los Angeles Tower or something. Completely wrong, which makes it beautiful because, <laughs> again, they knew the answer was false and they marked true. <laughs> so, yeah. So, 
Oh, okay. That. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, one of the other big ones they always get wrong, the muscle bound pull on the stick. Uh, for example, you have, yes. <laughs> Don't Google that. <laughs> Not that kind of movie. No. When, like, a perfect example is, like, Indiana Jones, right? Where just gotta, just, if he just pulls back on the stick hard enough, they'll make it over the mountain, right? After yeah. the engines have gone out. And he's just, uh, which actually is another one of the ones they always get wrong is if your engine sputter, that's, that's not a stall. A stall is basically when the wing is no longer producing enough lift to keep you aloft. Um, that's what a stall is. When the engines quit, the engines just quit. Um, what Indiana Jones would have done in that particular scenario is... Died. Died. He would have, he would have pulled back too hard. He would have Ooh. stalled out the wing and it would have went <laughs> into the side of the mountain and that would have been the end of Indiana Jones. What he really needed to do is not on the stick but just very lightly and very carefully maneuver and keep his flight speed um and try to avoid the mountain in some other way um other than doing that so yeah this would have killed but it's not as dramatic it's not it's not but also when you know you have you have these movies where airplanes are going into this nose dive and it's like and they just pull they can just just pull hard enough they can pull well what's really going to happen is they're going to break the tail off and then auger in um, it, basically, the airplane's just going to bring him to the scene of the accident. At that you point. do not need to be an airplane expert to roll your eyes at the opening sequence of James Bond, the movie Goldeneye. Uh, the airplane I he was repelling. What? I thought he was repelling in the opening sequence. He tonight. did that too, but that's a different okay. thing. Okay. Um, at the end of the opening sequence, an airplane goes off of a cliff, and James Bond's on his motorcycle, and he chases the airplane. The airplane goes off the cliff. And James Bond, like, 100 feet behind, you know, mm-hmm. follows uh, That's on right. the motorcycle. He catches up somehow. He does a free fall, catches up to the airplane as it's falling. He falls faster than the airplane does. Right. Catches it, pulls himself inside the airplane, and then does the... Uh, pulls up really hard, and then the airplane goes like... Yep. It's a safety. Yes. Which, and then you hear the GoldenEye theme song. Yes, which actually reminds me of the motto for Millieways. If you've done four impossible things before breakfast, why not round it off with lunch at Millieways, the restaurant at the end of the galaxy, end of the universe? Reminds me of the. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, all those things the, are impossible, by r- the way. Reminds me of the marketing campaign for Spirit Airlines, which is we don't give a shit about you. <laughs> nice. All right. I, I, I did not know that. <laughs> That's interesting. But yes, the... Economy the, minus. <laughs> I do... I think I had blocked out that scene from James Bond, to be honest, because I almost walked out of the theater at that point. <laughs> the rest of the movie was cool, and it had Arecibo in it, you know, so... Oh, um, Wonder Woman! A guy who only flies World War One airplanes knows how to fly a fighter jet in the 1980s with no training. Yeah. Yeah. Which... Because it's exactly the same to fly a 1980s jet versus a 1918 single prop yeah, you know, thing where you have like your Snoopy goggles on. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you wouldn't even know how to turn on the engine. Yeah, especially if it's point. invisible. Oh yeah, well yeah, there's that too. <laughs> the where did I park the airplane? <laughs> <laughs> In Central Park, apparently. Yeah. No wait, that was the the bounty. Um. So yeah, that's Golden Gate Park, Star Trek Four. Yes. There we go. It's See, I made, I, made, I made a Star Trek reference before you did. You just caught what I said. Yeah, but you got it wrong, but that's okay. Wrong! Wrong! Uh, so another one, too, is is really old business jets being rolled out of mothballs to be shown. Like, <laughs> these things have no business flying. Because, let's be honest, if you're old enough, if you're rich enough to, to uh, afford a, a business jet, you're not going to have something that's 35 years old with bad paint. Um, and that, you know... Where they find these things, I don't know. Maybe they keep them in some kind of like Hollywood prop hanger just for for such an occasion. But these old things don't fly, and no self-respecting business person would be caught flying them. So. The garbage will do. It's just a matter of how much bullshit can you put up with for the that looks cool factor, right? Versus the. Uh, well, and most people aren't pilots. Most right. people don't really eat, breathe, and sleep airplanes. Right. Some people do. True. Some people do. Um, and you know, and I eat, breathe, and sleep Star Wars. And I, this is kind of dovetailing in, but you don't bank in space. So all of the fighter scenes, literally all of the of the when you have Tie fighters and X wings and they're doing this. This is 
this is the way you're maneuvering through the air, right? Um, in Rogue One, I guess that would actually be kind of accurate because they're over the planet at that point. Um, same thing with, I guess, the attack on Hoth and stuff. But when <laughs> when they're over the Death Star and all the things where they're out in space and they're yanking and banking and stuff, that that doesn't... That's not how you maneuver in space. It's thrusters, and you just kind of get thrust in one well, direction. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's no, well, there's no real turn. reason for a wing if you're in space. There's no air. You, it's right. all inertia. I mean, right. the physics are that you will go infinity in the same direction unless another counter force pushes you in a different right. direction. So right. it would take a crap load of force to do that. Right. That's why would you? Yeah. Why would you exert that force when literally all you have to do to turn is you would just spin this way and then try to turn that way or just mm-hmm. thrust that way anyway. Uh, yeah, spin this way, thrust that Which way. Which is the only scientifically inaccurate thing in Star Wars. Yes, all the rest of it is true and accurate. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, but the be-all, end-all of movie F-ups, and I think this is for kind of a coolness factor, but <laughs> but it's really not that cool, is the, I'm a passenger in an airplane, and I need to get off, so I'm going to climb through the pressure vessel onto the landing gear <laughs> and find my way out of the airplane. Um, that doesn't happen. Uh, they're, the landing gear are in a section of the airplane that are not pressurized. The rest of the airplane is in a section that is pressurized, and the two just do not. Uh, there's a barrier you need, you between a, the you two. Need a really big can opener. You, yeah, I mean, you could, in theory, break open that section of the airplane with uh, suitable tools. Oh, yeah. But you would depressurize the airplane, so it's not like it would be some kind of subtle, like, oh, I think somebody might be sneaking out onto that. Like, oh my god, we lost pressure, we're all gonna die. Oh, by the way, somebody jumped out. <laughs> um, uh, the movie Commando is probably the absolute worst because um, they're going down the runway at about 200 miles an hour, and he, j- and he jumps off of the landing here and lands in the swamp, and everything's just fine. It's different from like. Uh uh, These Arnold Schwarzenegger, so you can do everything. No, see, what, the, what their mistake was is they should have had Chuck Norris in the movie, and then it would have been completely plausible. Well, Chuck Norris can do all of these things. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, let me just, let's let's reset. None of these things that we just listed apply to Chuck Norris. Of course. Yeah, I mean, and please, Chuck, if you're watching this, just don't kill us. Yes. Uh, yeah. But but I th- that just kind of... Doesn't that go without saying? that I mean, because physics don't really apply to Chuck Norris. I mean, Chuck Norris defeated, you know, destroyed the periodic table of elements because he only believes in the element of surprise. Chuck so, Norris ran so fast he punched himself in the back of the head. That, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. He doesn't do push-ups, he pushes the earth down. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah, the laws of physics just don't, don't, don't... Matter of fact, law is the name of one of his legs. The other one's order. That's why he sued NBC. Um, so yeah. That's, but no, Chuck Norris catch aside, me you, catch me if you can. They have a sequence where he hides in the in the landing gear, but he's like there the whole flight. You would would you die from that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, the temperature when you're when you're, like did he actually go through the whole flight hiding in the landing gear? I don't recall. Uh, well, if he, oh, I think that might be an example of. He breaking through the pressure vessel. I yeah, think. but that was before they. I don't remember. I'd have to but, there, it. but there's actually no access to get between. Like, there, there's there. You don't actually access the landing gear through any part of the airplane because, again, you wouldn't put a door there because you wouldn't want anybody to open it. The only time you have any kind of maintenance done on landing gear is when the airplane's on the on the ground anyway. Um, which is why when airplanes, you know, every once in a while if the gear doesn't drop, they will go skidding in on their belly. There's been um, actually a really good. A really good video that a that a passenger took of I think it was just a few years back where they couldn't get the gear down and you see sparks flying through one of the windows and you hear the um, one of the they're not stewardesses anymore flight attendants they're not um, flight attendants anymore either they're uniformed crew people okay you see you so you hear one of the uniformed crew people saying you know everybody stay down stay down and she's being very calm and they're not and stuff uniformed crew people anymore they're <laughs> the people that um, I don't know I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Uh, one of the members of the of the in-flight staff, uh, and I believe she received some kind of accommodation, but she's just telling everybody to keep their head down. But yeah, literally, the, the, they, it's not like they're going to work on the, on the gear in the middle of the flight. Uh, they just had to land with the gear up, and she did a good job keeping everybody, keeping their head down, nobody got hurt. Um, I make fun of the job title, but I wouldn't want to be a, I wouldn't want to be a flight attendant. I would suck at it. I'd have one unruly passenger and get fired. I... 
couldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we'd, we'd find a way to push him to the, to the pressure vessel. Yeah. I am Gorgonio! So, I worked at an airport in Marquette, Michigan, the former Air Force Base in Gwen. Oh, yes. I... Okay, I saw your international. I polished and shined airplanes, and I was not a guy who polished and shined airplanes. I was an exterior reconditioning technician. Sweet. They just, like, washed the damn plane guy. So you were an, <laughs> you were an ERT. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, trying to like use a little buffer pad on the underside of the wing to get a bug. Um, imagine what a bug does to your windshield. Now imagine what a bug does to the side of an airplane. That's not fun mm. to clean. I was the guy who cleaned that for a while. I didn't like that job. Hmm. But that's my only professional association with airplanes. You got out of aviation? Sorry, inside joke. <laughs> um, I was, yeah, I was laid off. You were? Oh, okay. Yeah, sometimes it's fun to get laid off. Um, so that's about all I had for airplane mess-ups. What about when Goldfinger, who's about this big around, gets sucked out of an airplane window, which is about this big around? <laughs> Does he die? Presumably he got sucked out of a window of an airplane while it was flying. Yeah. Yeah. The thing, the temperature up there is like incredibly cold. I don't want to put numbers on it. You could probably Google, but it's it's like, I mean, that's where hail comes from. If you have, you know, when when water gets pushed up that high or whatever, it forms solid ice droplets or whatever. So I mean, it's it's below freezing up there. So for one thing, you're going to be incredibly cold, um, and and you you can't breathe, which is why these things are pressurized. So literally, even if you don't injure yourself on the way out by, you know, getting your interior sucked out of your body like in the in the movie Alien Resurrection. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Well, that's the end of our episode. Time just flies sometimes. Uh, time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you.